Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to Unlock Value in the Back Office by Automating Processes, a webinar presented by Column 2, First Guarantee Mortgage Corporation, and Track Via. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. The webinar will be in listen-only mo mode. However, uh, you may submit questions via chat window. We'll incorporate these questions in the dialogue as we go. If we don't get to everyone's questions, we will follow up to answer your uh, specific questions. The webinar is being recorded, and a link uh, to the recording will be emailed to you all right, with that, we'll get into the webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce Sandy Kemsley, founder of Column 2. She'll be our moderator for today. She's an analyst, consultant, and business process architect uh, specializing in financial services and insurance markets. She's a featured speaker on BPM, business process management, and digital transformation. She's wrote, written several books on the subject. And she is the winner of the 2016 um, Mannheim Award for Significant Contributions in the Field of Workflow. With that, welcome, Sandy. Thanks, London. It, it always sounds more impressive when somebody else says it, so I'm happy to have your introduction. Um, as you've noted, I work both as an independent industry analyst and as a consultant to financial services organizations to help them with process automation and digital transformation projects, especially in their mid and back office processes. So in that dual role, I spend time researching business and technology problems and then some time applying that knowledge, which provides a good balance. So. I'm going to draw on that experience to provide a bit of context for our discussion today with a, just a few slides, starting out with some of the reasons why organizations automate their business, and in particular, their back office processes. So we're going to look at some of these reasons and, and metrics. So we can classify the reasons for why we automate as top-down, those are driven by corporate goals and growth initiatives, or bottom-up, which are more of the operational requirements. And most companies have a range of both of these drivers. They're not purely top-down or bottom-up as they're looking at their initiatives, although some will tend to focus on a few that are key to whatever their current situation is and their current pain points. Now, I started in process automation a long time ago, back in the imaging and workflow days of the 1990s, and we were all focused on business process reengineering then. Now, you can think of reengineering efforts as the origins of the digital transformation movement that we're in today, although it was mostly motivated by those bottom-up productivity and efficiency gains. Everything was about automating purely for the purpose of reducing costs and reducing, in many cases, the number of people in the, in the back office. So reengineering got kind of a bad rap for that, for precisely this reason. It was sort of focused on how can we re-engineer more people out of a job and sort of save money by cutting jobs as opposed to looking at the potential for, for growth. And there was really not a lot of connection with those activities to, to corporate growth and, and top-line issues as we um, looked at more of the operational things. Now, as we moved into the early 2000s, compliance got added to those bottom-up operational drivers, too. So we had everything from Sarbanes-Oxley back then to HIPAA now and everything in between. And now we had to have these um, a standardization of processes, monitoring and reporting on them to ensure that they were compliant with all of the regulations that might apply to our particular industry. And in the financial industry, there's a lot of those. It's just there's a lot of financial regulation and there's a lot of different things that, that have to where we need to ensure that we have compliance. Now, don't get me wrong, the, all these operational requirements are important, but these are just table stakes for being in business these days. All of these bottom-up drivers, you have to have those or you're not even going to survive in business. And one of the problem is, however, is that you can end up optimizing these operational requirements to the detriment of some higher level corporate requirements if you're not making sure that you align them. So you really have to look at both the bottom up and the top down drivers. So the top down drivers then, just to, to take a look here, is um, these are usually tied to some of the more public facing or shareholder facing metrics for an organization. Things like 
time to market for new products or the ability to scale up your operations to handle an increase in business. You bring on some new product, well, your operations have to be able to handle the increase in volume or else you're not going to be able to, uh, to keep up your business. And then customer satisfaction. So these have long been sort of the drivers for corporate strategy and the things that get mentioned in corporate strategy. But now we're starting to tie that directly to automation in the mid and back office because somewhere along the line, organizations have realized that having a great customer experience, you know, the thing that everybody's talking about now, requires great back office operations in order to support that. And a business growth strategy needs to be supported by back office capacity. So these two things go hand in hand as we have to be looking at both the bottom up and the top down drivers. Let's look at some of the results that companies are seeing in both of these bottom up and top down metrics on this next slide. So I've highlighted a few of the gains that companies are making that are they're directly attributed to back office automation. So obviously there's a lot of other reasons that companies are being successful at what they do, but I picked out these studies in particular because they were specifically tied to the back office automation. Now, not surprisingly, the first one we see on the left there from a McKinsey study, a lot of results in the bottom up metrics. So this particular report um, was on uh, automation in the back office of banks, shows 50% productivity gains due to automation. Well, I've spent a fair amount of time inside the operational areas at financial institutions, and this is not at all surprising. In many cases, a big part of the operations in the back offices are still manual. There, so there, there'll always be some line of business system, or more likely multiple line of business systems, that automate some core transactional capabilities. But then there's all of these other systems and processes that need to be updated in order for work to get completed. So it's not just about that one main system. It's about all of the other things that happen around that to get things done. And as we get, as we introduce one of our panelists a little later, we'll hear about some of those scenarios about filling in those gaps between all these different systems. Now, what comes as a bit more of a surprise, I think, to some people are the other two figures that we see here. So this is from a Capgemini study that was focused on the top-down kind of drivers that I mentioned previously. So this is specifically from a survey in financial services organizations. Um, they saw that 35% of the companies saw that their top line revenue growth um, went up by two to five percent directly attributed to intelligent op automation across their operations. Now, in a very competitive industry like financial services, you get certain areas where there's just not a huge amount of growth. It's just like you're, you're always um, getting and losing customers and so on, and the, the, the top line growth just isn't there very much. So two to five percent can be pretty significant because we're talking about large organizations as well. Now, the key things that they noted were contributing to that growth was being able to bring new products to market faster because they had more intelligent automation going on in the, in the back office, the mid and back office, and also improved opportunities for cross-selling because they could bring the information forward that made it possible to see what existing customers were doing and what else they might want to do with other services within the, the financial organization. Now, we also saw in this study that 64% of these companies saw their customer satisfaction scores improve by more than 60%, again, due to automation. So this is tied directly to the idea of intelligent automation within their mid and back offices. And the big reason for this is that now when you have a customer-initiated transaction, the customer asks you to do something for them, this could now be happen in a, in a much faster time frame because of straight through processing. And also when they had an inquiry, when they called in with an inquiry, there was a much faster turnaround time for an inquiry. So that customer service improvement was due to the faster turnaround time, which again was directly attributed to automation. Now in the, this, as I said, this hyper competitive world of financial services, customer satisfaction is directly linked to customer retention. If your customers are happy, they're going to stay with you. And that means, again, you can look at cross-selling them more, improving your revenue numbers, because they're, these same customers are staying with you. So those talk about results. Let's move on to the next slide and take a look at what type of processes we should be automating. Now, I don't want to spend uh, a lot of time talking about the first category here. These standardized processes and decisions 
are the main use case for a lot of back office automation. And this is a target of the large scale business process management and other IT projects. And in most cases, there's a very clear ROI in the automation here is we're talking about productivity, efficiency, compliance drivers that I spoke about, and as well as contributing the top-down drivers by just having faster turnaround time, faster cycle times on our transactions. But this is the, the high volume transactions that go through in a very standardized way. Let's look at some of the other types because these are the ones that typically don't get the attention when we're talking about automation projects. So they're, they're often not addressed that in part because there's less standardization. Each one might happen a little bit different every time or they might just be lower volume. And when there's lower volume transaction, um, lower transaction volumes, often IT just doesn't have the manpower to, to put into an automation project there. So we have to look at other ways to, to deal with those. Now, that doesn't mean that these things aren't critical to the business. We have a lot of very critical things, like I, I mentioned here, the high risk and mission critical manual activities, things like financial reconciliation. I see this being performed manually in a lot of organizations where they're reconciling between, uh, for example, an uh, investment management company and bank records or other third parties who you might be exchanging financial information with. They will come down to some financial reconciliation and there's a lot of room in there for errors and compliance mishaps if you don't have some amount of automation to help you do some of that, uh, that matching and reconciliation. Now, Every back office that I've ever looked at also has all of these what we call gap filling procedures or workflows that are using spreadsheets and email. And typically these are moving data and reconciling between different systems of record. And there's just those systems don't talk to each other or there needs to be some extra steps done in between. This whole thing is a bit of a compliance nightmare. The data is outside of any controlled system of record if it's in a spreadsheet. The calculations are done in a little bit of an ad hoc manner. And usually the workflow itself is done in kind of an ad hoc manner because the knowledge of the worker, they have to know who to send it on to next and what step to do next. There's no guidance for them about how to do that other than what they have in their own head or maybe a manual checklist of things that they need to do. So these gap filling ones are, are really important here. And we also look at issue resolution and uh, complex issue, re issue resolution and others fall into the um, sort of the case management uh, paradigm. Claims are another one that falls into here is we have complex claims that happen in all kinds of insurance scenarios. These are very uh, good target for automation, but often they get ignored because there's not a predefined procedure for completing them. So if you think about it, a knowledge worker has a case or an issue assigned to them, and they have to decide what to do next, who to get involved, where to pass it on to, what uh, calculations might need to be done. And this is all based on the information that they have at hand and the knowledge that they have about how to resolve this particular situation, the issue or the case or whatever needs to be done. And if they don't have all the information or they have wrong information or they're using an outdated procedure because something changed and they didn't know about it, then the case might not be resolved in the best possible way. And again, you can have compliance problems as well as customer satisfaction problems there. And the last one on this list is uh, analytics-driven events. And um, I see this a lot in things like fraud and anti-money laundering detection. A lot of times you'll have this happen in financial services where a knowledge worker or you know, people who are working in the process need to take a look at transactions that might look a little bit funny and manually flag them and send them on to an investigation group to see what uh, just to, to see if something is wrong or not so you can't always catch these things unless you're doing it in a more automated fashion now there's automation solutions that are starting to emerge for all of these types of scenarios so I'm seeing machine learning uh, for the uh, reconciliation type uh, problems, uh, rules-based decisioning for claims management and other sorts of issue resolution, and for the uh, analytics type of things, we're seeing event stream processing that will watch for multiple transactions that look strange when you take them in, in aggregate. And for a lot of the spreadsheet and email workflows, uh, as some of the issue resolution things, there's all sorts of low-code process automation solutions that are starting to let the operational areas build their own applications to automate some of these tasks. 
and then also to put some compliance guardrails around those that require human intervention. So there's a lot of different categories of things we can be looking at automating. And I think if you look at your own back offices, you can start to see how the things that you have might fall into some of these categories. Now, we're talking a little bit just using financial services examples here. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll see a few of the automation use cases in financial services before we bring in our other panelists. So I've talked about some of these examples already, um, and you can see where they fall in those categories of potential automation targets that I showed on the previous slide. So the trans uh, transaction processing, this is the high volume standardized processes typically implemented as part of an IT project that might be integrating a BPM system, a business process management system with line of business systems. Um, in investment management companies, for example, a lot of their transactions, such as buy this many shares of that particular fund, still come on paper from a financial advisor, and they need to be processed by a back office worker. So they're all done exactly the same way, and there's a lot of them. So this is just a variation on the high volume imaging and workflow processes that we've been doing for decades. So there's there's a lot of that that's still going on in sometimes with a manual fashion and some sometimes in which we can get a lot of automation benefit. Now customer onboarding and claims processing, these appear to be quite different things, but they're both examples of case management. So there's uh, some little bits of standardized processes in them, and then a lot of the work is in collecting information either from the customer or the claimant or whoever's involved and maybe from other people within the organization and then checking to see what else is needed in order to complete the case, collecting more information and then rinse and repeat until the customer is completely onboarded or the claim is resolved. So it's a very document focused or content focused activity and the success is really dependent on the specific skills of the knowledge worker unless you have some automation in there. So this isn't a case of automating the process necessarily, but it's making sure that the worker has the right information at the right time to make the right decisions, and then possibly making some recommendations to them about what to do next. So those are both sort of case management where you're doing some automation and then some guidance of the process, as well as providing the right informational context as part of the, the automation. The uh, fraud and, uh, and AML, anti-money laundering detection, are event-driven, so we'll have some combination of activities that look suspicious and need to trigger a process inside an investigations group. This could be an unusual pattern of, uh, of account openings, uh, so that you need to have somebody or something, in this case an event stream processing, recognize that you're doing, that the same person is doing a lot of account openings, or is doing some large financial transactions that look unusual, or even a large number of small credit card transactions from the same source. These can all be an indication that maybe something needs to have a, a closer look. And then you get ones like loan origination, which are a bit of a hybrid. It's like transaction processing in that there's a predefined process, but it requires some amount of knowledge work like case management. And the diagram on the right here is showing how automation can be applied in this sort of loan origination scenario where once the data is captured at the front end of the process, it's possible to automatically adjudicate and transfer the loan amount without human intervention as long as the decisions are well understood enough to automate them, but still leaving a human path for unusual situations that can't be easily automated. So automation doesn't mean we necessarily have to automate everything. It probably means we're going to automate the things that we know how to automate. And the things that still require a person to look at them and say, hmm, I need to do a bit more investigation on that, those will follow through with some human tasks in order to complete. So that's enough for me to provide some context for uh, the discussion we're going to have, and let's bring in our other panelists. So um, today uh, I'm joined by Sarah Batangan, who from First Guarantee Mortgage Corporation, and Sarah, we're really happy that you had time to join us here today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about First Guarantee? Absolutely. Thank you, Sandy. So um, I'm currently serving as the Chief Operating Officer for First Guarantee. Um, we also own the brand Good Mortgage. Um, I'm responsible for um, operations, credit risk, marketing, and special projects. Um, obviously, my largest responsibility is ensuring that we're operating to our fullest potential, of which includes looking at technology and partnering with our CIO. 
Um, I have a deep expertise in, in health systems. Um, I have a niche for um, identifying process um, optimization opportunities, of which a lot of times require uh, technical pieces to go along with it. Um, I'm about a 20 year, almost a little over 20 year veteran. Uh, I started when I was a baby, of course. <laughs> um, and prior to SGMC, I served um, as Senior Vice President of Strategic Business Operations for Stearns Lending, um, helping with a number of strategic um, uh, opportunities that were around improving processes within their uh, particular channels. Um, SGMC has been around for um, a little over 30 years. They were um, developed in 1987. Um, today, we're roughly around 350 to 400 employees. Uh, we do uh, serve two specific channels, a retail consumer direct channel, which is our good mortgage brand, um, and our correspondent channel, um, of which is about 70 to 75 percent of our overall business. We are licensed in 48 states, which includes D.C. Um, our corporate office is out of Tyson's Corner, Virginia, with other key offices in Plano, Texas, and Charlotte, North Carolina, which is where our good mortgage um, brand is. So That's you. great. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Welcome, and uh, it's uh, I'm I'm really interested in to hear more about some of the things that uh, that you've been doing. So we also have uh, Pete Kana with us, the CEO of Trackvia, and uh, it's the sponsor of this webinar. Now, Pete and I were on a panel together at Opex Week back in January, and it's great to have the chance to continue our conversation. So, Pete, can you, do you want to tell us a little bit more about you and about Trackvia? Yeah, thank you, Sandy, and it's good to be on another panel with you as well. Um, so I'm Pete Kana. I'm the CEO of TrackVIA. I've been the CEO here for seven years, and we've been a pioneer in our low-code application platform industry since uh, 2006. Um, so just a little background on me. Um, just like Sarah, I'm a 22-year veteran of the tech world um, in companies that try to innovate and disrupt maybe uh, legacy software industries and provide new ways for business users um, to solve technical problems in a very common sense manner. And so um, this is my fourth tech startup um, that I've been involved in and really excited to be on the panel today. A little bit about TrackVIA, as you know, but I'll cover this. TrackVIA is uh, the leading low-code application platform, and we're really built for companies to build applications that automate critical operational workflows and processes. So these are areas that maybe don't have a, um, an off-the-shelf software that um, companies have that they can take from. This is somewhere they have a special sauce or a snowflake effect of how they operate, and they want software to work the way they work. They don't want to have to work around their software. And so that's really what low-code is about, customizing applications that help improve their, their efficiency within organizations. We've been a pioneer in this space for over 12 years. Um, in the market. We're a recognized leader by Gartner and Forrester in the low-code market, and we service multiple industries, uh, financial services being one, but this broadens us out to healthcare, construction, engineering, manufacturing, and energy and utilities as well. That's great. Thanks, Pete. It's, I, I know our, our focus is really on business rather than on technology today, but you know, I'm a technologist at, at my core, and it's for, for me, I'm very interested in what's happening with, the, with how low-code platforms are driving us back from the, uh, the buy to the build scenario. People are now assembling best-of-breed components using low-code platforms and other sort of integration platforms rather than trying to buy one monolithic off-the-shelf application that does everything for them. So I think that you know, low, low code is is definitely something that's filling in a lot of gaps, but it's it's uh, getting higher and higher in profile these days. So Couldn't what we want to do, what we want to do um, for the the remainder of our discussion is to look at. Uh, we have a couple of different areas uh, that we and a couple of different themes that we want to discuss. And I want to start out um, on the next slide, looking at the challenges that companies face when that, that leads them to, to look at automation. Like, why do companies even look at automation? So I talked about some of the different kinds of drivers for automation, but Sarah, I'd be interested to hear about the operational challenges in particular that, that you had that, that you were looking at in your back office. Absolutely. So, you know, just in general, the financial industry is just really slow to market on available technology uh, to solve for what I, we keep saying back office, um, air quotes there, challenges. 
Um, and when we were looking for a solution to that problem, you know, we were looking for folks that could actually give us headache-free implementations, um, little to, you know, no dependency. I would say there's probably a no way that it could be a zero, but little to no dependency on internal tech resources. So ability for the business to own the technology and be able to create change, man change management processes that would help you know, drive change within that technology and really looking for something with, that was at a reasonable cost. To your point, Sandy, you know, a lot of uh, decisions around technology, you know, you have to weigh the build versus uh, buy option. And so for these particular, you know, issues that we're having, we were looking for something that we could somewhat uh, be, you know, low code based, easy to build, easy to implement. Um, and really, FGMC is no stranger to these, tech, you know, these these uh, issues, uh, back office issues. Um, I, I call it spreadsheet hell uh, in post production. You know, these groups are riddled with um, workflows that really depend on uh, Microsoft Excel, and there becomes a data integrity issue, right? You have the same data points on multiple uh, spreadsheets of which have to be reconciled. And, and so there becomes this um, data integrity issue of, am I really working off the most current and truth version of what I'm supposed to be doing? Um, on the flip side of that, there's a lack of data, right? So what is important? What do I really need to be looking at? Or am I just capturing cells to capture cells? And that with that lack of data, there's also a lack of operating systems to track that workflow. Um, you know, visibility to the rest of the enterprise on these processes. So whether I'm talking about, you know, post-production, um, you know, insuring and guarantee, uh, loan delivery, any of these things, all the way through QA, QC, compliance reviews, things of that nature, there's not a lot of visibility to the rest of the enterprise um, today unless you're looking at multiple spreadsheets and tracking and reconciling data. Um, you know, one of the really good examples of this today that I face is, you know, we have uh, post-production units that have to get loans delivered and, and we have, you know, asset cycle times that are very important to our bottom line. So being able to communicate with the business on whatever needs to be corrected. So, you know, a general per se audit is done. That review of that audit has to go back to a business. There has to be a turn back to them and this back and forth being able to track that information um, is, is certainly a problem today, right? Because the back and forth, there's there's the email, what you which you talked about, Sandy, as well as the um, you know tracking on the spreadsheet. So again, delays in those asset cycle times and 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 visibility to you know suspense um, items from our end investor, they all affect our bottom line, and we had a solution for that. Yeah, no, that's that, the visibility one. I hadn't really touched on that in in one of the drivers, but I think that that's really important. Is that if you're going to start to to link to other areas that need to provide some services for you, or um, you need to have visibility to management and so on, if you don't have some sort of automation, there's no way to surface those numbers up to uh, people who can take a look and say, oh, how's our business doing today? They, you know, they want to see one of those nice dials that's red and green, right? And they just want to see that things are in the green, but you there you have to have a way to to gather that information. Now, now uh, Pete, what are you seeing with other customers? Is what kind of what kind of barriers are they facing that keep them from from moving forward? That they're kind of looking at automation. Yeah, we see two kind of major barriers and themes um, to companies that um, have not yet implemented or acted on a new solution. And one is they try to solve the whole problem at once, right? It's kind of an older mentality of, hey, I'm going to put in a monolithic system to try to solve all of my end-to-end -to -end issues today. And typically, these workflows or processes they're trying to automate have stages or components to them that they can bite off the most critical aspect, implement that first, and move forward in an iterative process. That's our recommendations for folks. And so they don't have to solve everything at once and make this a six, nine, or 12 month process. Um, but people are looking at it as that's something they have to do. So I think it's something that as software becomes easier to use, it's obviously in the hands of a business user um, that we try to recommend that you solve one problem and then scale and expand to other problems. 
The other barrier. I think that's really yeah, that's a really key thing with low code is that you're now really bringing that iteration home. It's, that's been kind of the, the talk for many years about doing more agile and iterative development. But without low code platforms, it still just goes back to these old waterfall methods where people are like, oh, I'm going to only get one version of this. So everything has to be in version one. That's right. Um, and if if you really think how these systems work today, you want it to be an iterative process because your business changes maybe quarterly or every six months or annually, or maybe even more frequent, you know, if you're adding new products or new personnel into your, into your company, you want to be able to make those changes as your business changes. You don't want them to have to have a, a kind of a, a requirements build approve process that happens. You want to be able to do it real time. We always say we want to empower the people doing the work because they're the ones that know exactly what they need to achieve their goals. Um, to answer the second part of your question, the other barrier we see is that people compromise, which you don't have to do. A lot of solutions today are at what we call the, the dumbbell effect, and they create a, an I give up gap in software. So they either look for other large systems um, that are cumbersome or, or highly priced to start this process, or they go look at low end systems that are easy to use and they can get up and running quickly. We actually find with low code solutions that you don't have to compromise. You can get the ease of use, the flexibility in this iterative approach, but you also get the what we call enterprise security, scalability, and integrations um, aspect um, to your software as well. That's really why it's a platform for business users. And you don't have to compromise web versus mobile, remote workers, those type of things. And so we, as soon as people get educated around that, that there is no compromise and what they do today, we're almost future-proofing what they have and they can continue to scale. Um, once that mentality comes into place, we see them be very successful in this implementation. Yeah, I think that the uh, the data integrity and the data security is one of the things, and, and Sarah, you touched on that as well, is that you've got to get this stuff out of the spreadsheets and into some platform that's going to provide you with, with better control over, you, over your data. Otherwise, you have no idea, first of all, where it's coming from, how it's being enacted on, but you also don't know where it's getting to. So there, there can be privacy and security issues too that can be resolved by, well, okay, all of a sudden somebody can't just mail a spreadsheet to the wrong person now. Okay, let's move on and talk a little bit about solutions. So, um, Sarah, obviously we're very interested in how you're solving some of these challenges you talk about. Can you walk us through, uh, you know, one of your uh, your implementations, just how you went from kind of the problem to the solution, who was involved, what you did, and, and so on, just so we can kind of hear what it was like? Absolutely. So, you know, currently we're using Trackvia. Shocker. <laughs> uh, to help with these problems um, that we've talked about, you know, in streamlining workflow, enterprise visibility, data consolidation, and just overall asset cycle time. So, you know, we've started with three key areas within our organization. Um, I would say from a priority perspective, we st started with post-production. I always call it the redheaded stepchild of um, any financial organization. Um, you know, typically they're working um, either through, you know, some sort of bastardized workflow of the loan origination system that currently the, the company is using, or like I said, they're working outside of an LOS um, in something that's not a controlled environment with um, integrity issues. So, uh, you know, from a priority perspective, we started with our post-production unit, um, most importantly, ensuring and guarantee um, we're a highly... Um, uh, from a volume perspective, we do a great deal of, of um, FHA, VA government business. So being able to, you know, get those loans for insurability and, and get them uh, delivered to the investor is extremely important and, and certainly makes an impact to our bottom line. Um, so with TrackVIA, we've also, um, you know, integrated uh, a strategic BPO partner um, who also understands this platform very well. Um, it's easy to teach. Um, and, you know, they're laser focused on helping us create consistent and efficient workflows to help drive down our costs. So while the integrity piece is a huge part of it, there's also a cost driver, right? So I can increase productivity by people doing the same widgets over and over and over and over again, being able to deliver that same material in the same format with the same notification process to the business units in order to turn those files faster. Um, 
And then what we're looking to do is obviously expand that to an enterprise version to where we can now trickle throughout the rest of the organization that same data. So again, that visibility point of me, be, you know, me as a leader, not necessarily running post-production, but because it has a direct effect on the front end of what we're manufacturing, it's important to me to understand what are we doing wrong? Uh, how quickly can we get it turned? Is it a client-related issue? Is it an internal issue? And be able to you know, identify and fix those problems very uh, quickly. And then, you know, bottom line, and this is kind of a, um, echoing the same comment, is using that visibility to improve our front end operations more proactively. So instead of waiting till something blows up, I have the trending and visibility to be able to see it coming before it actually happens, and I can redirect my business units on being more proactive. So whether that's, you know, making changes in, in our overall you know, uh, reviews from a correspondent perspective and or tracking, you know, underwriting credit risk related issues from a um, underwriting perspective, um, I'm able to do all of those things. So, so who was involved in this, like when you were defining and what this, this new automation was going to look like, what your business processes should be, what types of people were involved in, in, inside your organization with doing that? So these are frontline business people, the people that do it every day. Um, kind of my little silly mantra is, you know, make and, and you know, imagine you have a magic fairy wand, and if and if you can make your day perf go perfectly well, what would it look like? And shoot for the stars, right? Figure out what what's actually going to drive down those costs. Uh, you know, create that, you know, customer sat that you were talking about, which our customers from a post-production standpoint are our internal employees as well as our investors, right? So we have to improve those asset cycle times. So, you know, how do we get loans out the door faster? How do we ensure we're not going back to the business multiple times on the same things over and over again? So really the business drives a lot of those um, processes. Um, and a lot of it is a, you know, test and great, that works, or test, and that doesn't work. And the beautiful thing about Trackvia is I don't have a ton of red tape to cut through if I have to make a change, if something's not working out. You know, the business right, because, you, the, because the correct. business is doing it for themselves, yeah. That's right. So did, did, you, did you find that there were new types of collaboration that started to evolve that didn't exist previously, new people kind of working together to, to find solutions? Yes, 100%. Um, you know, I think... A, it drove uh, a culture within our organization in that we were trying to solution for something that was going to affect our entire organization, right? It wasn't just one person dictating down, this is the way it's going to be. There was a lot of insight and collaboration. I'm going to go into that when we start talking about change management, but there's a great deal of collaboration that happened within our organization. So the business lines really kind of ultimately own the build, per se, um, but there's a lot of conversation around how does that affect anybody from a downstream perspective, whether it's at the front of the house from a manufacturing perspective, all the way down to secondary on the on the on the sales side. Right now, now Pete, is this is first guarantees journey sort of typical of other Trackvia customers? Are you seeing the same sort of thing? Or are you seeing a, a different sorts of models emerge for how they're getting to their solution? No, I think it's a typical journey. It's a best practice journey that we obviously try to guide customers uh, to as well, which means start with the big picture in mind, um, but kind of implement an application or automate a process that is most critical uh, to that big picture. So we call it kind of start small, scale fast, um, and make sure that, you know, you're looking at the results um, that you want to achieve as you go through this at every level of that process. Right. So what we find, too, is that you're not just automating an existing process. Obviously, that's step one. You want to get out of what I call manual, which I include spreadsheets in that manual kind of category. But once you do that, you also want to make sure you're improving on it, because when you get into a, a, a technology or a software like low code, you might do things differently because you didn't have the capabilities that you had when you were doing uh um, a manual process. So by starting small with the most critical, you may have a ripple effect that says we can cut out these four steps now that we have looked at the data, automated it, or have trigger fields that gets information to the right people more quickly. And so that's what we always try to talk to, to customers about is well, is and, making I, and sure I think that, that there. Yeah, there's the opportunity for that that sort of, you know, that lean type, where can we cut out the the waste in automation steps? And then there's also, because I think as people start to work with an automation platform, they also start to think about 
different ways in which they can even do their business, like new business models emerge, not just more efficient ways of doing the same thing. That's right. Um, and then how do these things kind of roll into the other processes that want to automate? And then you scale up, whether those are separate applications or just um, additions to the current process or workflow that they have. Um, and we find this, you know, these themes are across a lot of different industries, not just financial services. Um, even though there might be different goals, you know, we find a, a customer we have as a large government contractor that wanted to, to automate and digitize really their entire kind of resource management. So, um, but they had one large government contract they won for the Defense Department. So we, we focused there and they could find all of the, the workers that needed to be they built an application around skill sets, top secret clearance. Have they worked for these contractors before? What were their skill sets? Implement it for one project and then grew it to 250 to 300 ongoing projects that they had. And they learned every time and made the applications or processes more efficient. We have a large manufacturer who want to give visibility down into the procurement cycle for business units. So they knew which vendors were performing the best, not just on dollars, right? That they had before, you could say, you know, Sarah, here's your most, your highest paid vendors that you have out there. How can you consolidate those dollars down, right? Which is a typical conversation, but you really want to know um, who are the best performing vendors that you have. And then we have kind of a, an oil and gas company that wanted to improve safety and compliance in the field. And the theme with all of these customers is that they have a large system that they had in place for 15, 20, 25 years. And the goal isn't to rip and replace. We want to augment those systems because they have a function. They just don't extend well to what you're trying to do in the future of your business. And we're trying to augment that. And that's the best practice as well that you want to talk about. Augment those systems. Don't try to rip and replace and slowly improve and creep into what they're doing. But they have a function um, that's there for either CFO or executives of business. But to Sarah's point, the people who are doing the work, they need changes either monthly, daily, on a quarterly basis. And these systems um, that allow them to do that and take control of their own destiny are what we feel are the systems of the future. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I certainly see that uh, a lot of companies are not doing the rip and replace that used to be the popular thing. It's like, no, 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 we want to take what we have and extend it, link it together with other, you know, some other newer systems, and then put some more interesting and, and functional skins on the front of it that, that we can deal with. But I, I do want to come back and and talk about some of the change management issues. If we say, move on to the next slide, it said, Sarah, you mentioned this as well in our when we were talking about the solution just now, is I often find that there's a big cultural shift as back offices move to become more automated. So it's not just in the way that these solutions get developed with people actually developing their own solutions, but also people's jobs change and the way that they interact with information changes. And the, you know sometimes they have to learn new skills and they also have to learn to kind of trust the system to make certain types of decisions. So what's your experience been with the change management aspects of automating processes? Um, so this is what I like to call my, my three C's. I've done you know, a ton of work with regards to process optimization and change management is so key to any of it, regardless if it's the topic we're talking about today or whatnot. So communication, right? So transparency on what we're doing and why we're doing it. You know, are you doing a rip and replace? Are you not? Why are you doing all of what you're doing? Um, collaboration, right? So we talked a little bit about that earlier when I was talking about the business unit really kind of driving the, the overall workflow and, and implementation of, of that workflow. But there's collaboration with other folks in the business that needs to happen so that everybody is on the same page. And then thirdly, collective execution. So it can't just be one person executing, it has to be the entire organization executing on that plan. And so um, I would also take it a step further to say that it's not just my organization, it's the partner, right? Or multiple partners, right? In this instance that I'm talking about today, you know, it's not only just FGMC and us, us executing internally, but, you know, TrackVIA plays a role in it, our BPO provider plays a role in it. And so everybody kind of has to work together um, to be able to make the change uh, successful. So what's the, um, when you have to uh, adapt a new workflow, uh, like who, who gets involved now? Is it really the frontline workers that are still doing the business every day or have you developed a group of sort of citizen developers who focus on, on doing changes and managing the changes? So one of the things, um, we haven't quite figured out that piece yet, but to be completely transparent, um, right now the business somewhat owns that, but some of the things that we're looking at is 
um, you know, track via university. You know, there are these classes that these folks can take and get certified in and that, that they can, you know, make changes not not in necessarily for your entire organization, but it's almost like you have SMEs within your particular group that feel empowered to make these changes quickly on a dime. Um, now, again, uh, while I'm a very you know good component of making changes quickly, there has to be a change control process, right? That kind of goes along with change management. Um, you know, from a compliance perspective, you know, if you're making changes that could affect something later down the road, those things have to be documented. So we're still figuring that piece out as we implement, but um, but it's certainly on a radar. Have you had any sort of hiccups where you're you bringing in automation and and the business users aren't really happy with it, that there's some resistance to it? So I have not personally faced that. Um, this is my third time launching with this product, and so I would say I'm, we've become experts at it. But um, so for those that aren't, though, um, you know, really the 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 icing on the cake is is getting your folks down and getting them involved very early on in the process let them see the demos not just your higher ups not just the people that are the decision makers but let them be involved in the decision making process see how much uh that you know because look at the end of the day if i can come in and get twice as much done with less headache and less concern about what i'm doing is going to end up you know incorrect or not viable later in the process, I don't have to revisit it. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to listen, right? Because I don't want to continue down the path of having to look at things multiple times or somebody telling me my data is incorrect or my boss standing over me saying, well, this number doesn't match this number. Where'd you get the number? So, you know, I, if I have those options up front to, to be a part of that decision making process, you know, it, it makes things a lot easier from a change management perspective. So yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can see that. And certainly, that's been my experience too. Is that the more you get people involved, the less resistance there is to change. Correct. But to say that there's never going to be resistance, that's an unreality. <laughs> there are right. Resistance yes. To so, so Pete, obviously, you have been with you know TrackV has been through a lot of different customer implementations. Is what sort of things? do you find really help the customers deal with the change management issues? Yeah, one is uh, obviously when, like Sarah said, no matter what change there is, there's always either resistance or challenges to it, right? And so we try to talk to folks about picking something that's critical to the company's success, whether that's, you know, developing a workflow or digitizing a process around that, because when you first get into an initiative, it gets the most attention. And you want everyone that, to be bought into this from the department level to the executive level, and so people can understand what kind of culture on these systems you're implementing as well. Change doesn't have to be bad, it just has to be thoughtful, and then it can be responsive, and then it can be have business impact to it. And so the other you know, kind of change management best practice is make sure we def you define upfront what outcomes, results, or impact you're expecting to get out of this change um, or to automating these processes. So you can always bring people back to the, to the results because you know, as everybody I'm sure has put some new system in place or new process or even a new policy, people forget over time why you're doing it, right? Because they get involved in their jobs and it's always good to have an anchor back to saying, you know, the old way, it actually took us 28 days. Now it takes us two. I know you may still not be happy with it, but it's an improvement and we'll keep working on it to get better well, on that. Well, remember the days, um, well, you might not remember, but for those of you on the call that are in financial services, remember the day when we went to the end of the filing cabinet and pulled the manual files off the desk and, and literally stuck the five pounder on your desk? I mean, those are the types of conversations, that anchor conversation you're talking about, where today we say, remember when now files are digital, completely digital. There is no more bratting and five pound files sitting on your desk and, and, and whatnot. So. Technology does really come full circle on those on those items. It does, and that's yeah. You, you kind of have to let, and you have to let people know, like kind of the the what's in it for me thing. Like you have to be able to show the the workers at the front line is that hey, this is making your job more interesting because you're not having to do the boring repetitive stuff, and it's making your job easier because you don't have to deal with those pounds of of, of files anymore. So there's there's always kind of at different levels you want to be thinking about what's what the benefits are. So let's move on and take a look at results and just uh, what, what some of the results are. So 
I know, Sarah, you haven't been at this this long in your in your current role, but I'm sure you're seeing some kind of benefits already. Do you, do you have some metrics around that, or do you have any measurable things you can talk to us about? Uh, absolutely. Like I said, we've we've launched this a couple of times, so you know um, that that sort of kind of history and kind of where we are today. I mean, the stats are are typically pretty substantial. Um, we usually see um, a 40 to 45 percent increase in productivity um, when we're able to introduce um, automation. Um, from an improvement on the front end, so what I would say in the manufacturing process, um, you know, we see another about 15 to 20 percent increase in just overall customer set, um, you know, productivity because they're not having to double touch things and things of that nature. Uh, we also see a significant decrease in what um, are described as manual errors. So, you know, these autonomous processes now um, basically eliminate a lot of the manual errors of having to key in data, right? So in, in, in our particular example at FGMC, you know, we're tied into the LOS. If you type in a loan number, it's going to go out and it's going to reach out for that data um, through through an API and be able to bring data back versus somebody having to manually key in line items across the spreadsheet or something along those lines. Um, uh, you know, I would also say, you know, this particular platform yields, you know, trending reports, um, activity monitoring, things that I don't, I can't necessarily do today without a piece of software like this. Um, Overall, we see margin improvements uh, because we can sell our loans faster on the secondary market. Uh, we improve our gain on sale. Um, you know, there are early delivery um, price improvements that are available. So again, just overall improved asset um, cycle times. Uh, I touched on this earlier. I touched on it again. You know, improved customer set. Our customer for this particular launch is you know our employees within our other parts of our enterprise as well as our investors, right? So being able to get loans to them faster, that makes them happy, makes us, you know, makes us more profitable and makes them happy. And then I think, you know, what it also does is it allows us to bring on other mortgage products faster and um, makes us more competitive in the market. So, you know, recently we've launched Maverick Solutions um, and you know, we were able to do that so quickly because we have these back-end processes that can handle uh, more difficult, more complex products uh, that necessarily we weren't built for prior to making this implementation. So it sounds like, although you started with looking at kind of the, the more of the bottom-up operational drivers, like, oh, we need to be, you know, more compliant, more productive, more efficient, and so on, you've really kind of driven into those higher-level corporate goals, too. Like, you're improving the margin, you're letting products roll out faster, which is obviously a, a, a revenue issue, as, as well as dealing with kind of the, the higher-level risk and compliance things. It sounds like you've kind of met both, uh, mo both ends of the, of the requirement spectrum. I would agree. Pete, what um, Pete, what kind of benefits, uh, uh, like other types of benefits, are you seeing with your customers when they're when they're dealing with the back office? Are you seeing things in addition to what Sarah's been talking about? Yeah, we see uh, similar things to what Sarah talks about, where it's reduced cycle times, increased productivity, kind of greater visibility and control into their end-to-end -end operations employee and customer satisfaction. But the real benefit that we have customers realize is this is better business results. And let me dive in there a bit, is that you've all heard about the concept of, you know, connecting the dots. Our real philosophy is that your software, your, your automated systems should actually create the dots for you, right? That's the data, whether that's the analytics, or that's the key aspects of your business. And then you want your key people um, to make decisions off of those dots, meaning connect them together. And there's people, the key folks along those processes, the stage of those processes that have critical ownership there, and you, you hire them because they have intelligence, they have industry knowledge, and those are the ones that you want making decisions. And we find that once you have visibility into that, you're making better business decisions all the way uh, uh, through the chain. And that's really what the result of, if any of you have ever had to do a quarterly review or an annual review to your boss or to your department head, you spend most of your time collecting all of your data so you can show them what exactly what happened in the business, and then you decide on a quarterly basis what you're gonna change, right? That's the old school mentality from my standpoint, that should be gone. What you should be doing is making day-to-day, month-to-month, week-to-week changes because you have visibility in that business real-time 
and you know what you need to do to improve it, and that's what you really want to automate these processes for. Right, and you can't have continuous improvement if you don't have some sort of continuous visibility into what's going on and the agility to be able to, to change things in order to, to correct direction. Well, let's finish up then just talking about what's, a, what's ahead. Um, Sarah, can you give me an idea of what you have planned for the future in terms of more implementations or, you know, is it more of the same or is it some, some new and exciting things you can tell us about? Sure. So, you know, certainly the consumer and client experience is really the new front line in our industry. I think with raising rates, compressed margins, market consolidation, you know, you really have to be a player in this field. And, you know, in order to get the front of my house very focused on that consumer and client experience, um, you know, the back office piece certainly has to be cleaned up. So we will certainly be, you know, as part of our overall digital um, project, for 2019, we will continue to expand um, using, you know, this low-code software um, throughout our organization. Um, and, you know, TrackVIA really plays an, an integral part of our, what I consider our customer experience project for next year. Um, you know, we're looking at launching a new point of sale um, and other things regarding our digital experience for the consumer. And so getting that back side of the house in line so that the front of my house can focus more on the consumer and the client is extremely important. So um, specifically, you know, we'll look to not only finish out post-production, but we'll start working on our QAQC. Um, we will also work with um, our legal and vendor management pieces, compliance, marketing, HR, and things of that nature. Um, this is something that could be expanded throughout our organization, um, and uh, we're certainly looking forward to it. But I think that's one of the unintended consequences of bringing in, the, especially with a low-code automation platform where you don't have to have a big IT project around it, is that all of a sudden you can start to look at areas that you never would have thought of addressing with automation. And it's like, oh, yeah, HR, we can do some stuff in HR, or we can do some stuff in legal, or various other places that can really benefit from the, you know, the same sorts of things as you're seeing in the operational areas. Yeah. One of the other things I will say, um, and you know, we we have not necessarily gone mobile at FGMC yet with Trackvia, but you know, consumers in general, whether it's FGMC as the consumer or you know the the end borrower on a more, you know a lending transaction, you know, people want anytime, anywhere, any device accessibility to information. And so, you know, having a secure way to do that through, um, you know, through a mobile platform or, or something along those lines is certainly important too. We all, you know, I deal with a huge amount of my staff that is remote and on the road sometimes. And so being able to access that information is also something else we're looking at. Great. Um, Pete, so, so beyond the kinds of things that Sarah how they're expanding, what other sorts of suggestions do you have for, for companies that are really looking to, to do something with their back office processes and beyond the back office? Yeah, I try to tell customers to keep two things in mind when making the decisions or planning for a, kind of the digitization um, in their company is, one, make sure you have a system that can scale. And what, my, what I mean by that is that this needs to be a platform that you're not just going to put one process on or digitize one aspect of your, your workflow. It's in the future, you're going to want to put 5, 10, 15, 20 of these kind of processes together. And as you automate them, they're going to have interaction together. So if, they're, if you're going at this with separate disparate systems for each process, you're just creating problems for yourself in the future of how they integrate, how they talk to one another, how you can aggregate reports, and how you have visibility into your end-to-end -end operations. And the second is make sure you look for a complete solution. Don't compromise. Right? We find that, that workflows and processes have three key aspects to them, and we call it the acquire, analyze, and hack. So you want to make sure you have a, a system that can acquire that data, either through manual entry from your, from your users or through integrations and other systems. The same system should be able to analyze that data for you and visualize it however you, your business sees fit, bar graphs, grid view, pie charts, however you want to look at it. And then has logic in it so you can set up all this automation that through your, your business logic, it can act for you, route the information to the right places, give customers information, update reports, and all this can be done on a desktop and a mobile, which we call omni-channel, right? So you don't have any compromises. Um, so those are the two bits of advice I'd like to give our, our customers and prospects. 
Okay, that's uh, that's good advice. Well, I want to thank you both for for being here today. Um, London, did you have any closing comments you wanted just to to close out the webinar? Yes, I just wanted to thank our panelists, Sarah, Pete, and Sandy. Thanks so much for your time. Just a reminder, this webinar was recorded, and we will be sending it out. Thank you.